Good morning, everyone. It is Thankful Thursdays. Glad to be here, everybody. Enjoying the week so far? I certainly am. Welcome, everybody. Let's get the questions rolling. We have great guests on today, as always. Looking forward to seeing everyone. Welcome, Lori. Welcome, Marco. Lello, let's see who's here. <clears throat> great to see you. Yes, uh, Justin has the same polo as I do. The Rose Bowl polo. The shirt of roses. Anyway, it's going to be a great day. It's Thankful Thursday. Remember to say thank you before you go to bed and when you wake up. Let's talk about communication today. Communication with the greatest source of light, love, and lessons coming through you with gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, with appreciation, you adding value to what you receive and giving it away. Thank you, Cameron. I totally appreciate that. Coach Missy, good to see you as well. Anybody want uh, our template for five daily practices? Just go ahead, email me, david at dmelzer.com. Beautiful morning. So grateful to have all of you here with me. So grateful, Keaton, that you've joined us as well. Here we go. Uh, if you're getting anxiety throughout the day, what relief tactics help, help you? Uh, I have a practice of applying my why, of practicing ending fear. Uh, once again, I send that to everybody, david at dmelzer.com. What you need to do is create a practice of ending fear and anxiety. It's a practice. You're not going to stop it. It's just a practice of spending minutes and moments instead of days, weeks, months, and years in anxiety. And we do that through the stop, drop, and roll methodology. So identifying what we're afraid of, what makes us anxious, the ego itself and needs of the ego to be separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, resentful, and all of these different feelings. When we can practice, number one, identifying, and then two, utilizing the stop instead of the resist, the drop instead of the accelerated, and roll instead of moving in the wrong trajectory, you will spend minutes and moments in anxiety instead of days, weeks, months, and years. It's the greatest, greatest gift I can give you. If you'd like that template, david at dmeltzer.com. I also always am happy to send my books to you for free, ebook, audiobook, and of course, uh, ebook, audiobook, and of course, my signed copy of my book. I'll send that to you. Not a problem at all. All right, let's keep the questions coming. Um, here we go. How to sell. Well, there's a five to thrive process in selling. You need to learn to stimulate interest to get people to find people with open minds to get you to call you back. Then you have to transition interest, utilizing credibility and emotional attachments. Then you need to share and articulate a vision. Uh, that the quantitative value is greater than what you're asking for uh, in doing so using the reasons, impacts, and capabilities. Then you have to manage those expectations with a go, no, go plan. And then you can thrive selling through people, not to people. Uh, if you'd like the videos or my template on the five to thrive system, I'll send it to you for free. David at emailster.com. Or of course you can text me 949 298 2905. Both are pinned below. What is the power of two-way communication versus one-sided communication? Well, one-sided communication is you are talking to people. When you're listening for what they want to listen for, and you're taking information from the greater source of light, love, and lessons, allowing it to come through you, adding your value or interpretation to it, and then giving it away, you are communicating effectively through yourself. And that's a two-way communication from the greatest source through you with appreciation. That's gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability to others. Instead of speaking to people, listen to what they're, they want to listen for. How to build real relationships, being of service or value. Uh, five basic steps of knowing what you want, finding people that are aligned, synergistic, and supplementary to what you want. Those are the who. Finding out who can help you and who you can help is the best way to find that relationship. Carry credibility by being your higher self, your truth, and emotionally attached by finding out and being more interested than interesting in people, finding out what they like and they don't like and how you can be of service and add to that, and vice versa for you to find out how they can be of service to you. Uh, very good. Uh, I'm looking at uh, here. Titus Jack is in the house. Uh, all right. Let's uh, bring our friend Dewey on. Craig Dewey uh, is uh, with the non 
Arteric <laughs> Isometric <laughs> Optic Neuropathy, the N A I O N. Hello. Hello, how are you, Craig? Morning, David. How are you? Good, good. Where are you good. right now? In your car? I am sitting in my car in uh, outside of Chicago. Oh, yep. I, and, uh, I, I, got some construction going on in the office, and so I thought it'd be better to come out here. Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind it at all. I love I love doing business in the car. That's one of the best yeah. things. Well, anyway, give us a little bit of background on the N A I O N. I apologize for not pronoun pronouncing it correctly. Uh, very familiar no, with R P. Uh, um, it's a mouthful, and I'll tell you, there's not a lot of people that know about it. Um, it's a uh, almost a sudden blindness that occurs uh, with some overnight. Um, I was lucky enough that it happened over a couple week period. I guess it's lucky enough, right? Uh, for some, it happens to both eyes. And uh, we're in the very early stages of trying to, to come up with, um, and I it's expressed this to you earlier, we're coming up, trying to come up with a foundation uh, just to get the word out and to let people know about this. And I know it, you know, obviously I've had this issue, but uh, I went to the, second largest city in Illinois to an ophthalmologist office and, and they had no clue what it was and probably took two or three weeks uh, before I got to an ophthalmologist that knew about it and diagnosed and by that time the the treatment for the uh, the treatment really was to reduce the swelling in the optic nerve and by the three week time frame it was it was gone so I've lost probably 80 uh, percent uh, in this little fella right here and hoping to keep my blood pressure down so my other one uh, doesn't happen. But that's that's really what, you know, the issue is, is um, getting it out there and letting people know. It's got the same case rate as ALS, the same case rate as uh, muscular dystrophy, but, you know, those have celebrity attached. And, and we were told, that, uh, personally, I was told you don't have a, a Michael J. Fox, which is kind of a crappy way to put it, but that's, you know, there's no there's no exposure to it. Uh, there's no urgency within the healthcare field. Um, there's no, you know, if I'd have known, and I consider myself relatively intelligent, I had not even heard of this until I had it. So if you know about it, you might be able to figure out how to do it. Yeah, no, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, aggregating the needs of uh, smaller issues that don't have the exposure or awareness, but yet, you know, 6,000 cases a year, uh, right. warrants, you know, attention and education and financing. And those are the three things that we really need to give to these types of causes. Now, one of the nice things is we have a GoFundMe type of platforms nowadays. And because of social media, we have a much greater reach uh, in that individuals right. uh, like us can have a reach of a Michael J. Fox and raise the awareness of, you know, this and other small, uh, smaller types of, of diseases that are impacting thousands of people. Um, and what is the best thing people can do? Go to the gun, GoFundMe page and just finance research on it, raise awareness. Well, I, what best can we I do? think we, we set up the GoFundMe page initially just to, to be able to set up and, and, and finance the foundation that we're trying to start. Again, it's very early stages and uh, really, it, it's at this point, I think it's more knowledge of it rather than donations or anything like that at this point it's just not set up yet um but again looking for connections that that may have had this or may know someone that has this that you know we can work together and we've got a facebook page that's got over 900 members on it and again you know with six thousand a year uh there's there's it's really so early on and trying to to get publicity to this um so so that's why i sent you that the uh, the naaion.org uh, and also the, the GoFundMe, which I've um, I sent you, but I don't have the specific link to that. It's it's a it's the Nayon Foundation um, GoFundMe. Um, but again, more, more getting exposure out and, and just passing this along. And um, again, and, uh, and, and timing is critical because there is some steroid treatment options if correct. people are aware, but even the ophthalmologists aren't aware of this, and so. They can, you know, save someone if they actually had just the education of being able to identify it. The, the typical use now for steroids is, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, within the first three weeks, two to three weeks. And then beyond that, uh, and the steroids is to lower the swelling in the optic nerve that you may retain some of the sight. Once it happens, you're pretty much guaranteed uh, you're going to lose some sort of sight in, in whatever eye is affected. So 
the, the prednisone, the steroids is critical within the first probably two to three days. Um, I have a stash in my, in my office that if something happens, if I happen to see the little orb, and I got, <clears throat> I've got prednisone that I'm going to pop and then call my guy. It's not, a, it's not an appointment affliction. It's an ER affliction. And I didn't know about that. The ophthalmologist that I, I spoke to didn't know about that. Again, it was three to four weeks before I saw someone that knew what, knew what this even was. And explain what it is so people do experience or know someone that's experiencing it. Explain what happened so people can rush to the ER. So it's, it's a good question. Um, I mean, it really came out of nowhere to where it was a little a blurry spot off in the peripheral. And then <clears throat> that was on a Friday. And then it somewhat progressed to uh, a, a curtain you know, on the lower half of the vision, and then that progressed to a little bit more. And uh, once I started on the, on, the, on the steroids, the center of vision was taken over. So now, I mean, personally speaking, the, my center of vision is gone in my left eye. I still have all the vision in the right, but there's still some peripheral. And it looks like the uh, best way to explain it is a, a Vaseline smudge on a lens, you know, mm-hmm. but it's that, it's that little floating orb that doesn't go away out in the peripheral. And then it gradually you know, expands into, again, a, either a curtain or some sort of a sheet. Um, it, it's pretty bizarre. I mean, that, that's the only way, you know. And what, and what causes it? <laughs> I'd be happy to take anyone that has any questions. Do they know what causes it or how to prevent uh, it? it? It's The underlying cause is probably either a, either a drop or a spike in blood pressure. That's why it happens overnight to some to where you'll go to sleep and your blood pressure, blood pressure will drop. You'll wake up without sight. I mean, that, it's that shocking. And so, so for me, the treatment was to mitigate, you know, to find out that there were, were no underlying causes. You know, I went through the CT scans and the CAT scans and x-rays and everything else. They tested me for lupus, for you know, everything. And to me, they could only point to the blood pressure. So for me, it was to mitigate, you know, and keep the blood pressure within range. I don't necessarily have high blood pressure, but it's a drop, a sudden drop that makes the um, that cuts off the blood to the optic nerve. A lot of people call it an eye stroke. It's not an eye stroke because there's no blood issues other than this constriction of the optic nerve. It's just so bizarre. Wow. Well, I appreciate <laughs> you raising the awareness. People can find you at Titus underscore Jack underscore zero one. Of course, they can go to the N-A-I-O-N uh, dot org. Uh, N-A-I-O-N dot org. Is that correct? N-A-A-I-O-N. N-A-A-I-O-N dot org. All right. Two A's there, just so everybody knows. Yeah. Uh, let's raise the awareness. Let's uh, reduce the amount of cases per year and the effect mm-hmm. of those. Thank you so much, Craig. I really appreciate you, what you're doing to help other it. people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Very, very important uh, that when these things happen, we have the capability today to save lives, save Uh, vision, which saves lives. And uh, I appreciate Craig coming on and sharing uh, that with us. Thank you, Jake, for putting that up there. N-A-A-I-O-N.org. They have a GoFundMe uh, campaign as well. So look that up uh, in support, raising the awareness. So anybody out there, your family's uh, members or someone has that happen, rush them to the ER. It is not an appointment. It is an emergency. Uh, Awesome. Let's uh, keep this party well. We got tons of questions coming in. Love to see it. Uh, love to be it. Let's see here. All these great questions today. Thank you so much. Um, do you meet people on LinkedIn? Yes. And then meet them in person? Yes. Uh, I have four ways that I communicate with people in person, on the phone, via email, and media, traditional and social media. Uh, but yes, I uh, use LinkedIn. I do meetups. I just did one in Orlando. Uh, we had an extraordinary turnout and uh, sharing ideas, answering questions, doing the best that I can to be of service and value to others by leveraging my situational knowledge, by providing mentorship uh, I make available. Email me, david at dmelter.com if you need any help at all. Uh, So I love meeting people in person. How do you balance confidence with humility when you are at a networking event? Thanks for pouring into all of us. Um, So... Confidence and humility go hand in hand. Uh, Confidence is created by having clarity on what you want, balancing your values with what you want, and getting focused or paying attention and giving intention to what you want. That creates the allowance of things happen, the coincidences of those things that happen. And uh, understanding 
that lets that blend occur, that you allow things to happen, you're humble. If you think you're making it in control uh, and should be credited for anything other than the effort that you put in, uh, then you're mistaken. Clarity, balance, and focus creates the coincidences, creates the confidence. It takes persistence. It takes humility in order to effectuate that. Remember the mathematical equation of luck. Attention plus intention equals the coincidences in your life. If you want to be called lucky, then give your clarity, balance, and focus on what you want, and those coincidences will happen. You will be confident and be humble uh, in the manifestation of what you want in attracting that to yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, Pamela Jane, uh, Operation Scrubs, are you here? Uh, give me a little shout out. I'd love to have you ask a question. So many uh, here to go forward anyway. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, do you have plans to come to the UK? Yes, and I plan on taking two-minute drills to the UK, being part of the Level Up uh, initiative there in the UK. We're going to shoot a network version of Two Minute Drill. If you haven't seen Two Minute Drills on Bloomberg, on Amazon, check it out. <clears throat> You'll love it. It's the only pitch show. Uh, no funding, just $50,000 of cash and prizes each episode. If you want to apply for season three, david at dmeltzer.com. david at dmeltzer.com. And I will see everybody. We'll do some meetups when I'm in the UK for sure. Uh, thank you for joining you. Uh, planning on going to India when it's opened up and safe. Uh, so abs absolutely. Um, looking for Jane as well. How to network. <laughs> First of all, you network in person, on the phone, via email, and media, traditional and social media. Networking is, and I have a template for networking, by the way, david at dmelter.com. I'll send you my networking template of one, having credibility, sometimes just with a smile or look them in the eyes or a handshake, emotionally connecting to somebody, uh, being able to find out what they like and don't like, using your own personality to provide value or service or to ask for value or service. Uh, but networking is not only creating relationship, but, but it's having an ask and a two-headed ask, like a two-headed dragon. One ask is how you can be of service or value by finding out what they're doing today, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. When you find out what they don't like about it, see if you can be of service so that you can help them with that. Or if you find out what they like about it, see how and what you can do to make them like it more, provide more value to what they do like by providing them more of what they like. Uh, and then also find out what you can and how they can help you, sorry. Uh, and that's the two-headed dragging, what they can do for you and what you can do for them. It's that simple. Utilizing credibility and emotional attachment in person, on the phone, via email, and media. Networking is the ability to connect and ask, ask and attract. Being and utilizing the attention and intention into those relationships for the coincidences that you want. Richard, good to see you here as well. Rachel, always great to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, very nice. Uh, all well here, Jake. Uh, I do not think uh, that Jane is here. Hey, what's going on, everyone? The two-headed dragon of networking. <laughs> Get my template, david at dmeltzer.com. Are you planning on writing and releasing a new book anytime soon? Yes, I have several books. One uh, with Jeff Fenster with about mentoring and menteeing, being a mentor and a mentee. Uh, he's one of my prize uh, mentees that is just killing it uh, and uh, just so proud of him and he's very raw and honest about uh, what it's like to be a mentee and turn into a mentor and uh, what lessons he's learned and what lessons he still has to learn because uh, we're all on that journey and then my other book is don't do business with dicks uh, which is surrounding yourself with the right people the right ideas uh, we will move on um, is Wes Stringfellow here? Uh, happy to take your questions as well. Thank you very much for keeping these rolling. What is a job you had that isn't usually part of your story? Um, you know what, what? One of my favorite jobs I had that is not usually part of my story, although I've mentioned it a few times, is when I was in college, I sold book systems. Uh, they're basically encyclopedias, but they're more than encyclopedias. Uh, they were books to read to your baby when they're in your stomach, 
They were children's books to read when they got out of your stomach. They were preschool books, kindergarten books, all the way to an encyclopedia with a bookcase. And it was thousands and thousands of dollars. And you, I learned how to sell financing and sell payments. Um, and I would do one or two appointments, two or three nights a week. And uh, the company would buy leads uh, from hospitals of new parents or parents that were having babies. And I would go and, and talk about the importance of education and how for just $50 a month uh, for the rest of their lives uh, until the kids are graduating, that it'd be the best investment uh, that they made. I'd leverage the story through credibility of my family and all the Ivy League siblings that I had and how important it was to be read to and to read and to continue to be able to do research. <clears throat> now, that's a job that I don't normally talk about, but I learned so many different things uh, at a young age. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Curious if you believe that reaching a goal is as important as the journey or pursuit itself. Well, I believe we reach milestones, right? Uh, I don't believe in attaching my emotions to an outcome. For me, um, I personally enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of my own potential. Hitting milestones and surpassing those or going by milestones or not getting to milestones, but through pain, lessons, mistakes, failures, setbacks, being pushed to a better milestone than I even imagined, a different milestone than I could ever have imagined. Uh, but yeah, I do not attach my emotions to an outcome. I simply try to, minutes and moments outside, try to focus in on the journey, the ability to be what I must be and uh, to angle to what I want and end up somewhere better than that even. All right, great questions here. Keep them coming. There's a lot, so I really appreciate everybody. Uh, make sure you come to Friday's training this week, Passion, Purpose, and Profitability training is tomorrow, 11 a.m. Pacific. We do 6 a.m. Clubhouse. We can ask these questions uh, there as well. Do you meet people on LinkedIn and then meet them in person? Oh, I already did this one. Hey, once again, proving I'm human. Uh, if you weren't wondering, here we go. If you were to live anywhere but California, where would it be? Portugal, uh, probably live in Portugal or uh, Madrid, uh, somewhere outside of the United States, most likely. Um, if I was gonna live in the United States, I would probably live uh, with my kids. I would live um, maybe Idaho, uh, some parts of Florida, maybe Texas, some parts there as well. Um, some are warm, uh, so most likely. Barcelona would be great. Yep, Colleen, I'll be right. We'd be neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. All right. How to be a better listener. Well, there's three types of listeners, and I think that's the first approach of being a better listener. Um, one uh, you have people that are interrupters. So limit the times that you interrupt people. Two, there are people that are waiters. Uh, what they do is they pretend to listen to you and then they're just waiting to tell you what they think. So you got the interrupters that just tell you what they think and aren't listening. Then you have the waiters that wait to tell you what they think, but they're really not listening. And then you have uh, the processor, the, the person who is more interested than interesting, the learner. Uh, and that's where I spend most of my time to try to be a better learner, a better listener, a better processor by being more interested than interesting and knowing that uh, life is about lessons and the lessons are going to keep on coming until I learn them. So I want to be that learner. Uh, so um, here we go. Um, Pam is here. Uh, different address. So let me just quickly grab Pam. Oh, no, nope. she's going to have to upgrade her, her IG. Pam, I know you're late on here. I, I believe that's Pam, Pamela Jane Nye, uh, operation underscore scrubs. You got to upgrade your IG. Uh, the different handle, Jake, is not working, uh, just so you know. So um, I accidentally pinned it, though. Uh, can you go ahead and uh, also pin up David at dmelter.com so people can reach out to me? And get some of these templates uh, as well. What is the most inspiring thing that has ever happened to you? 
Um, having children, <laughs> uh, by far. You know, being there for the birth of my children um, is by far the most inspiring, in spirit, uh, expansive. Uh, can't explain it to anyone. And, uh, you know, you try, but you can't. So uh, having my children uh, to me is the most uh, inspiring thing that's ever happened to me. Um, oh, if the Chargers win the Super Bowl, I wonder if it'll, it'll rank up there. I know it will for miles. <laughs> All right. What's the difference between purpose and passion? Uh, so purpose is your thoughts about purpose. Passion is a feeling about pursuing your purpose. Purpose is your thoughts about your purpose. And passion is the feeling in pursuing your purpose. Profitability, obviously, is the ability to make money. <laughs> Profit. All right. But we're going to train per passion, purpose, and profitability. But in the meantime, Wes Stringfellow is here, the founder of How Do, uh, howdo.com. I love that. And uh, <laughs> how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? How do you do? <laughs> I'm doing well. How about you? Uh, I'm very well. And really was curious about your innovation training. You know, obviously, there's a difference between innovation and entrepreneurship. Yep. And a lot of people uh, don't know that distinguishment. So what are some of the universal innovation training tools that we can expect to learn uh, with what you're doing? So uh, I, I run people through the, the what I would call the full life cycle of innovation training. Uh, it starts with the foundations, which is getting your mind right. Most innovators and entrepreneurs fail because they stop learning or they get too wed to uh, some idea. Uh, and I try to help them break those mental models before they get into the process. Then we go into a deep understanding of the customer, which is the foundation of all of your thought if you're innovating or an entrepreneur. Uh, but the customer, then looking at the competitor and how they interact with their customers, looking at the market, which is the prevailing pestle environment, you know, political, economic, social, technical, environmental, and legal. Once you understand that, then you start making decisions Then you can actually go like figure out what your business could be. And we walk you through the three tools that every business has. And these are the only three tools, build, buy, and partner. Build is building a platform or a product or a service. Buy is uh, corporate venture capital or mergers and acquisitions. And partner is incubator or accelerator. So we walk people through those three tools and then you can get nothing done without a team. So we teach people how to build a team, how to hire, how to manage, lead, and then ultimately, if needed, you know, let folks go. So it's, it's and, the full life cycle. And then innovation, where does building a need come in? So sometimes if we're customer-centric and we're innovating, we're innovating towards a need that no customers can perceive. And, you know, therefore, you know, uh, it's a different type of creativity and innovation that takes a lot longer to come to fruition. How do you tenor or temper people who, you know, see a need, but there may never be a customer or the timing is not right for that. For example, I was the CEO of the world's first smartphone. Uh, it, it was not known as a smartphone at the time. Uh, it was a convergence device. It was expensive. <laughs> it was slow and expensive. It was a great innovation. It won best of Comdex, there so many different awards, but there really wasn't any customers at that time. Now, obviously, uh, you know, Steve Jobs proved that it was a great innovation and made a fortune off of it because he had the better timing of it. So I, I, look, at, I look at it in one of two ways. Uh, if you have a lot of capital, then time's pretty irrelevant because you can extend your product uh, or your, your time to market indefinitely. Like for example, uh, I was on the team that launched Amazon's digital video product. And uh, we launched that in 2005. <laughs> the number of people watching digital video in 2005 was zero. The number of people watching digital video on Amazon or from any corporation was zero. And so, you know, we built a product from the ground up but with, with stuff that no one had ever heard of. We built it ourselves and no one really used Amazon digital video until about 2014. So it took them eight years of sitting around until they actually started to get traction. Now, by the time they got traction, they understood the game better than anyone. And now they're one of the best in the world. Whereas if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have enough capital to sit around for eight years, 
It's real important to understand where your customer's willingness to engage in new products and services is, because if you use your capital incorrectly, I mean, all entrepreneurship and, and, or innovation or any investment or business is, is capital management. If you burn your capital too fast, you're not going to live. If you, if you time the market right and use your capital effectively to hit to market with the solution, you have a chance. That is genius, by the way. I love when someone gives some solid pragmatic advice uh, because time is that pragmatic variable, time, emotion, and value in innovation that people don't talk about and they don't manage the expectations. Uh, now, you've been a resident entrepreneur in some very large companies and uh, in the how-do type of process, where do you think people fall down the most? In the head. In the head. It's why I start with the head. I can't tell you how many people that uh, entrepreneurs, I talked with an awesome entrepreneur yesterday. Uh, she's in Australia. She's doing this really cool closed loop clothing company. So there's no waste. Uh, and these are the kind of companies I love helping, right? Because they're doing good for the world. Um, but in her head, she kept telling herself, I got to make more money. I got to make more money. I got to make more money now. If I don't find a new revenue stream, da, da, da. And that was driving her team crazy. They're like, we're not fixing the operational processes that are on fire today, right? Like they, 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 she was so wound up with, I got to get investment that she stopped looking at what's actually happening at her core business and her team. And so that's the, you know, that's the story she tells herself when she gets out of bed in the morning. I said, why do you come to work? What do you work for to do? And she's like, I got to get more money so that I can do more things. And I'm like, what if, what if you could, do more things with the same things you already have if you just focused on fixing the problems on your hand. You might actually grow more organically. And then she's, you could just see that that was not a thought she was comfortable with because she'd rather do the thing that she was comfortable with, which is just go find more customers. And that's not how businesses scale. You have to actually understand the business operationally. And in order to do that, you have to have the discipline to turn down opportunity. You have to have the discipline to dive deep when there are no answers. And you have to find the answers in your own business. No one else is going to answer the, the questions about your business that need to be asked other than the entrepreneur. And I see so many entrepreneurs focusing on vanity, like I need to raise money or I want to get my voice out or I want to pimp myself over here. Or, you know, it's like the ego of it is not what makes entrepreneurialism successful. In fact, the most quiet, boring operational people are generally the most successful entrepreneurs. And I think getting to that place where as a person, you're comfortable not knowing the answers and working until you have them and, and recognizing that there's a cost benefit trade-off you have to make. There's an analysis you have to do. Should I spend my time today finding new revenue sources or should I spend my time today growing the revenue that I have? And if you, if you can't make that decision clearly with the full understanding of how your competitor is working, your competition is working and the market is working, then generally you lose. 95% of businesses fail and a vast majority of it is because what's people what's in people's minds. Yeah, I think it goes beyond, you know, I would say the common denominator of all successful people is the spirit of excellence of a desire, yeah. desire that you must be what you can be. Uh, but a lot of times they're putting their attention and intention on the wrong things to be, uh, yes. and, you know, if they're willing to learn those lessons and that's why so many, you know, innovators, you know, they have that desire, but they're sitting there 10 years later, nowhere, but they're not going to quit because right. they're not open-minded enough to figure out, hey, I, I'm, I got the wrong what. How important is mentorship in the How Do program? It, it is like the most important thing. Like, I, I don't, you know, in any program, mentorship is the way that we learn. I mean, if you look at, well, what is mentorship? Mentorship is simply a relationship between two people that is, you know, kind of like tribal knowledge. Like back in the day before schools, that's how everyone learned everything all the time, everywhere, right? <laughs> like, so we as humans have a natural way of learning that, uh, learning in that manner where we, we have someone that we can mimic. We have someone that we can emulate. Uh, we go real deep on how to, on how to be a mentor. We go real deep on how to build mentorship relationships. And we also go real deep on, on communities of practice, which are a group of mentors. Because, you know, when you look at every business has to do five things well. That's it. They have to grow revenue, reduce operating costs, mitigate risk, empower employees, and delight customers. That's all every business has to do. 
And if you find a mentor that can do all of those things, that person is super person, right? <laughs> like there's, there's no one who's great at all of that. So you probably want to get a mentor for each one of those dimensions. And that's just for your business. Then for yourself, like I have so many mentors that help me. West, you're being an asshole. Stop being an asshole. You know, like that's really helpful advice. <laughs> yeah, that, that, mentor, that mentor in my life is my wife. Yes. Yeah, totally. The pe <laughs> like, like our friends and family can be our best mentors. And so, yeah, yeah no, I think it's, it's foundational to, to everything that we do. It's, but it's especially essential in business because it's so easy to get wrapped up in, you know, the hype cycle of it as opposed to the mechanics of it. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, Wes, it's incredible because I have so many guests on so many shows and a lot are about entrepreneurship. And there's a different frequency when I'm talking to you about someone that has walked the walk, in, including in the mentorship side of being a mentor and still being mentored as both of us are. And I tell people all the time, if I could go back when I was 18 years old, all I would tell myself is ask for help, right? Right. Find, Right, like find somebody. You, Hardest you know, thing to do. It's, it is, <laughs> especially if you're hyper. You know, if you're hyper successful, it becomes even harder, right? And you think the opposite, but you know, it's so interesting because at its core, you know, I love the way that you and I mirror each other in simplifying things to like. Here's the five things you have to do. Here's a right. We we all yeah. have these simple things, but on mentorship, to me, it's like, hey man, if you want to get somewhere. Find someone that's already there and ask them for directions. Yes, right? and, and, and I agree with that. I agree with that completely. I always say the hardest business problems have been solved before. So you just take the big problem, you break it into tiny, tiny little problems, and you find the people who have solved those little problems. That's all. When I when I so I I, uh, I built new platforms and products at Amazon, PayPal, Visa, Rosetta Stone, and Target. Like every time I went in there, and I'm like, okay, what's the problem? I don't understand the problem. Who can I get to understand, help me understand the problem? And then what's the solution? I don't understand the solution. Who can I get to help me there? And then I just do that ad nauseum. I find excellent people and I say, what does it take for you to believe, number one, in the mission that we have, and number two, that you should join us on this mission? That's all I want to know. And if I can get them on team, then my job is, I, I call myself the missile defense shield. If you're on my team, all the bullshit missiles stay out. And then everything under that defense shield is just for us to incubate. And if we do our job right, that shield grows. We get more of us. We all make more money. It's a good thing. If we do our job wrong, that shield goes away and we get covered in shit. So, like, we have to do our job. And my, my job is simply that, to empower other people, you know. And, and, and in doing that, we have been able to do incredible things. Yeah, you got to go to howdo.com. If you're not buying into this, then you don't get it. This is a simple step-by-step -step way, utilizing years of situational knowledge, experience, and dummy tax in order to effectuate what you want. As an entrepreneur, step-by-step, -step, I love your five things. I'm going to go to your website and grab those and uh, get and learn those myself. You know, I'm not quick enough to pick up all five immediately. Go to at West underscore strength fellow or how do H O W D O dot com. West, you got to come back on, man. I uh, sit here. I'm learning so much. And uh, you, you walk the walk, which is rare. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having. Have a great day. Thank you. You too, man. Congrats. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. There's a guy that knows what he's doing. You know, you can tell the difference. We got a lot of people come on here. And uh, he looks a little bit like Michael Keaton Keaton, by the way. Uh, I don't know, Wes, if anybody's ever told you that. You look a little like Michael Keaton. Uh, anyway, uh, did Jane get her stuff fixed here? If not, I'll take another question. Jake, let me know. I'd love to help Jane. She has a question. She runs Operation Scrubs, a nonprofit organization to elevate the knowledge of nurses in the area for all types of things. Uh, and uh, I want to thank her and other first responders for all that they've done, especially over the last year and a half. David at dmelzer.com. Just reach out to me. Thank you, Wes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I, it. I thought they would have. Uh, anyway, David at dmelzer.com. Get my simple templates, the five daily practices combined with what Wes is teaching. I think you can make a lot of money, help a lot of people, have a lot of fun, live your life with passion, purpose, and profitability. Be an innovator. Understand time within the context of your values and emotions. That's what West is talking about. And like I said, he walks the walk and talks the talk. 
if someone cannot afford it, would you still be willing to mentor them? Yes, I have free mentorship. I have group mentorship that everybody can afford and it's guaranteed profitable. So it's an investment, especially if it's free. Email me if anybody wants mentorship and want to know all the different ways. David at dmelzer.com. I'll send you my book for free as a first step. Ebook, audio book. I'll send you a signed copy and ship it to you. Uh, here we go, Pam the nurse. Let me see if it'll let me grab you, uh, Pam. Uh, no, yeah, it won't. Um, yeah, Pam, we'll have you join us. You can join me on uh, tomorrow, Clubhouse, 6 a.m. Ask me a question there. Uh, Breakfast of Champions, 6 a.m. Uh, it's not letting me join Jake. Uh, I see her there. It's Her IG's not updated for some reason. Um, but I am available on Clubhouse tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. On my training as well, Passion, Purpose, and Profitability, I have Q&A there tomorrow at 11 a.m. Jake, why don't you have Pam join us tomorrow on Clubhouse or Monday, Ask Me Anything. IG Live, right there Monday, come back again if it's updated or on Clubhouse, 3 p.m. Anyway, let's take one more question. I thank you, Pam, for, for trying, uh, and I thank you for your service. Uh, Pamela J. Nye, at Operation Underscore Scrubs. Thank a nurse, teamchallenge.org. We want to talk and understand how we can help you as well. How did you face your fear? I do it every day. I do it through the stop, drop, and roll. I do it through my five daily practices. I know my what. I know my who, who I can help and who can help me. I know my how, indicating uh, that as well. I know my uh, now, what should I do now? And I apply my why. Uh, anyone that's angry and commenting, please reach out to me, David at dmelter.com. I'll give you my cell phone. Call me. I'd love to talk to you and heal you. Uh, so we don't need to, to offend anyone here. That's not what we're doing. Uh, but my number is 858-688-3294. Uh, anyone here that uh, doesn't feel good, isn't happy, needs to, to have judgments, conditions, anger, offensiveness. Hey, we forgive you. Just call me. I'd, I'd like to heal you. I got a, a lot to help you with. And I know Lori knows as well. So Anyone here, you know, obscenities and things like that are not uh, appropriate or appreciated on our stuff, but I will help you. So just call me and I'd uh, love, to, love to talk to you. You can text me to 949-298-2905. Uh, I, I get it, ma'am. All right. Let's take one more question as we pray for that person's happiness. Uh, all righty. Here we go. Josh Medlin, unbelievable director, producer and coming out to film office hours next week. All right, how did you decide on empowering over 1 billion people? Too many people are killing themselves. They don't know what happiness. So I have five daily practices that help people make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. In other words, be happy. Five daily practices. So I thought, man, if I could teach my values and the five daily practices to a thousand people and have them teach it to a thousand people and they teach it to a thousand people, a thousand times a thousand is a million, a million times a thousand is a billion. I can create a collective consciousness of happiness. We could change the world. One little particle of darkness, uh, well, light overcomes a million particles of darkness. So this should be easy. Let's all learn it. That's why I give my books for free, ebook, audio book. I sign a book. I send it to you. I pay for it all. Don't worry. David at dmeltzer.com. Text me. Number's right below. Love to see you. Must be what you can be. That's what Josh Medlin is. Uh, incredible talent. With a lot to learn still, though. A lot to learn. And I'm hopefully going to be a help in that as he is a help to me. He's a big-hearted and open-minded person, and I appreciate him. If you haven't seen his stuff, check it out. He's on here right now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. Remember, tomorrow's training is Passion, Purpose, and Profitability, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Join me. Uh, over 50,000 people have registered for my trainings over 20 years. David at dmeltzer.com. Thank you so much. But most importantly, everyone, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.